Well, you can see that the heading here is the Treaty of Waitangi and Fano, Hapu and Iwi well-being. Um, now, I don't know how to do PowerPoint presentations, and I got my research clerk to make this up, and TPK and Superu told me I had to talk about the Treaty of Waitangi and Fano, Hapu and Iwi well-being. Um, I'm not really going to talk about that. <coughs> Um, but you know you're at a big hui when your two opening keynotes are a psychiatrist and a judge. <coughs> you know you've got some real big problems to solve <laughs> if you get a shrink and a jailer <laughs> to come and talk to you. So um, I wanted to talk about something that I think is kind of deeper than the treaty. I think the treaty has probably given too much to carry, and that we've got a deeper core that the treaty <coughs> sits on top of and we don't think enough about. And um, it's kind of relevant to um, our hui. So I thought I would um, work that idea with you a little bit, if you'll bear with me, in the 22 minutes and 47 seconds I now have left. Does that work? Oh, yeah. So, about a thousand years ago, as we know, Kupe, um, Kura Marotini, their great nieces Machu and Makaro, and about 22 others from Hawaii, did what no human being had ever done before traveled a greater distance than any human being had ever done before. In fact, the greatest feat of any Polynesian. And the Polynesians were the greatest astronauts of their time. And the thing they traveled in, this is a rendition of Kupe's Waka Matahorua, was the height of the technology at the time, the fastest craft on the planet land or sea, at the time. Capable, in this case, of traveling 3,500 miles, four weeks without sight of land, without breaking up, to a place Kupe didn't know, uh, I've structured the sentence wrongly, Kupe didn't know where it was. Sorry, those of you who are grammarians know I screwed that sentence up, but to somewhere he didn't know where it was. He knew it was there, and his science and his technology told him to be absolutely sure that it was there. He just had to find it. He was the navigator. And of course, he didn't. It was his wife who found it. Because what did she say? What did she say? Wahine ma, what did she say? He ao, he ao, he ao te aroa. A cloud, a cloud a long white cloud. Actually, what she probably said was kupe. Eoho! <laughs> now, on behalf of the men in the room, I'm, I'm, um, I'm sympathetic because he was the navigator. He's up all night. He was probably fast asleep. <clears throat> he was probably far grabbing, grabbing a few minutes sleep when she saw this vast conviction cloud, a bigger cloud than any Polynesian had ever seen in the history of our race. So she didn't just say, he ao, he ao, te, he ao, he ao te aroa. She said, he ao! Kupe, he ao! 
Holy shit. <laughs> That's what she really said. Sorry, Papa. And when they came on Matafaurua, now I know there are traditions on the East Coast that say it wasn't kupe, and I don't belittle, I don't belittle those traditions at all. I'm just telling you the traditions I know. Now I know there are those who say, kotoi ke, kuai ke rane ke. And you could equally say that was the waka belonging to that explorer. But the traditions I know say it was kupe, and that's what I'm talking about right now. When he came, he and Kura and the 22 others on board weren't a blank slate. Not only did they bring a system of technology with them, they brought a system of values and of law and of social organization that had worked well in tropical Polynesia and they transplanted it to very temperate and occasionally sub-Antarctic Aotearoa. It's the laws that I want to talk about. A system of values and principles for the organization and administration of kin communities. This is the kind of, to me, this is a deeper set of ideas than the treaty carries. And we kind of forget it. And we need to remember it when we are thinking about whānau, hapu, and iwi well-being. Here's the system of law these great explorers, the greatest explorers on the planet then or since. We know that because, um, what's his name, Diamond? Not Paul Diamond, no, the, fam the famous anthropologist. Not Neil Diamond either, the singer. <laughs> Someone Diamond wrote Germs, Guns and Steel and um, Collapse. Very, very famous um, anthropologist. Jared Diamond, that's right. He said that the, the, the exploration of the Pacific by the Polynesian people was the greatest feat of the human species. And what I like about that story, as I'm going to take it, is that the greatest of all those journeys was this one. Because he had to cross south, across the Roaring Forties into, uh, into another tropic. In order to get where he was going, he had no idea what was there. So if you ever have a chance to, to explore these, uh, what went on during this period and be proud either to be a Maori or a New Zealander, do it because this story should be told and retold in every school in our country to make us all feel a little bit of well-being, and frankly, it's not. So, five principles drove these explorers. And the most important of them all was what I call the principle or the law of whanaungatanga. The centrality of kinship and of careful attention to relationships above all else. So we know that Fanongatanga controlled and controls relationships between us humans. In his day and for the entire period up until the arrival of the treaty itself, all of your rights and obligations, your so social status, were initially at least defined by your Fanongatanga relationship. That's why <coughs> Māoris remembered their whakapapa. Because it wasn't just a cool thing to list all those names. Your rights depended on you remembering that whakapapa. Your rights to land, to water, to fisheries, to mountains, to rivers. Your rights and obligations to those around you were all defined by this motivating principle, this impelling principle called whanaungatanga. But it wasn't just, whanaungatanga wasn't just about relationships between people. Every time a speaker stands on the marae, every time a kuya calls, she speaks to the dead. Why does she do that? Because of the law of whanaungatanga. Because whanaungatanga reaches into the past and reaches forward to the future. It creates rights and obligations with respect to your dead, and with respect to your yet born. And even that's not enough, because whanaungatanga 
is the way in which those old people explained their relationships with the physical environment. They had no idea, in my respectful view, about me owning that mountain. They had no idea about me owning that river. Had a very good idea about the river owning me. But the idea of property in something actually belonged in the Northern Hemisphere. What these people did was say, I am related to that thing. So when they talked about maunga A or B, they said, e koro e kui. When they talked about the awa, they said and still say, kuo ko te awa, ko te awa kuo. They encapsulated all of their relationships with the physical environment as kinship relationships. Because inherent in the idea of kinship is the idea both of right, because you know they had to eat and drink, and of obligation. Actually an idea not central to the concept of property, but deep in Cooper's consciousness. And not just that, the entire non-physical world Knowledge itself was explained using whakapapa, and still is. So you want to understand how plants are related to one another? You have to understand their whakapapa. Now I'm not talking about Linnaean whakapapa, I'm talking about Māori whakapapa. Why was that? You know, when, when Ruka Broughton took me into the bush and said, Anenga, Anenga tupu motena motena motena. Here are the, here are the rungwa plants. He explained that to me in Whakapapa terms in order for me to understand that you stay with the senior line if you can. Stay away from the junior line, they're likely to be trouble. That's actually a deep Māori idea. The junior line is likely to be trouble. But sometimes the junior line will be your salvation because the older ones will fail you. What must the tainer do? Make good on the wrongs of their seniors. So, the whole world, visible and invisible, was explained, rationalized, realized, and rendered tangible by the law of Fanongatanga. And if you take nothing else from what I say, remember that. Because that's more important than the treaty, in my view. I'm not saying the treaty is unimportant. I spent a career working with the treaty. <laughs> but that idea is what makes us Māori more than anything else. So, he bought things like mana, Tapu, utu, kaitiakitanga. But when you think about all of those ideas, they are all different faces of the rights and obligations of kinship. Now that system worked pretty well till about 1812, something like that, and a new system came. This new law was fundamentally different. It introduced the idea not of highly fractionated leadership systems, valley by valley, every valley having a king or a queen. And you have to remember that whakapapa meant senior lines weren't just male lines. They were very strong female senior lines, and that's why women insisted on signing the treaty because their whakapapa was better. And of course the Brits said, no, you can't do that. So the idea of a central crown with unrelated officials dispensing its law gets introduced here. Unrelated in the sense that you have no whanaungatanga tai with them. The idea of individual dignity and the autonomy of the subject or the citizen. 
an idea slightly strange to the Māori who thought inherently and instinctively collectively, even though mana actually has an individual dignity aspect to it. And this is a key one, because social and economic relationships weren't defined by kinship by this tribe. Kinship had nothing to do with social and economic relationships. All of your social and economic relationships, at least since the Industrial Revolution, and they were in the middle of the second part of that right at this time, were defined by contract, freely entered into by theoretically autonomous individuals, absolutely fundamental to this system of law. And relationships with the environment were not kinship relationships, they were encapsulated in the idea of property, of ownership. John Locke's idea that the role of government is to protect the individual property rights of citizens or subjects. So, you've got to get the clash between these, these two systems. In understanding the clash between these two systems, you've got to get how fundamental that difference is between a system whose impelling power is kinship and a system whose impelling power is property augmented by the autonomous power to enter into contracts in respect of that property. So, it's kind of like this. A Māori without a whakapapa, without whanaungatanga, is like a capitalist, an American, let's say, for present purposes, without a dollar. Now, I don't mean that in any pejorative way at all. I mean it in a purely functional way. That system organizes itself in that way, that system organizes itself in that other way, and they went bang together. And the idea of whanaungatanga was summarily, militarily, and legally removed from the economy, from the law, and the religion of these people. The hapu was no longer the resource allocator in accordance with whanaungatanga requirements. Central government did that now through land title systems. And of course, by in introducing for Māori, the Native Land Act, whose job it was to individualise title into scrip in order for individual Māori to sell it behind the backs of their communities. And hapu and whānau no longer had social control mechanisms, no longer had the levers of social control over their members. The police, the courts and the government took that role. So whanaungatanga no longer had a practical, economic, or political role. Over a period of about 100 years. Now, despite that, I haven't got that up there, but despite that, around 1940, a guy named J.C. Beaglehole wrote a book called The Māori Today. It was, it was for the... Um, for the uh, millennium, uh, for the centenary at the time. And he was struck, he wrote in this book, something that sort of surprised me now when I read it. He was struck by the low level of mental illness among Māori as late as, as 1940. As they continued to live for Nongatanga lives, despite the removal of the political and legal and economic utility of whanaungatanga. Right up into the 1940s, Māoris were not in mental institutions. And the statistics at the time show that Māoris were not in courts in the 1940s. That phenomenon, both phenomena, sharply rising, occurs in the 50s and 60s as we move to the cities. And the big dent in Fanongatanga occurs once that break is made. So, 
Let me talk a little bit about some of the deficit stuff that I have walked away from, from my seat just up the road in the High Court in Wellington to talk to you about here in hopefully a more positive light. So the result of this collision, this 170 year collision between property, individualism and whanaungatanga can be seen reasonably clearly. This is in my life. So this is, these are numbers that are real to me because I see them every day. 55% of those in prison are Māori and that has been stubbornly so even though our population is growing spectacularly. Our population has grown by a million over the last decade and a half, I guess, Len, you, you'll know. It's grown very quickly, but stubbornly Māoris are stuck at 55%. For Māori women, much worse, 60%. Māori children are 60% of the SIF removals in this country. 5,000 kids a year, 3,000 are Māori. 83% of people under 20 in prison have been in SIF care. You'll instinctively know these numbers are right. You, you may know them much better than I do. three times more likely to be arrested, three to four times more likely to be charged if they are arrested, 11 times more likely to be remanded in custody instead of bailed, four times more likely to be convicted, and that's, the, that's not just than Pākehā, that's than other New Zealanders, seven times more likely to be imprisoned. These are shameful numbers. And of course, they speak to wellness. But that's not the end of the story. And I'm afraid that messages get a little scrambled now because I've thrown this together relatively quickly. Please bear with my subpar performance. Yet Whanaungatanga still lives. That's the extraordinary thing. After all of that, yet Whanaungatanga still lives when it is legally, economically, and politically redundant and has been for more than 100 years Yet Whanaungatanga still lives and has found voice in what I call the third law of Aotearoa New Zealand after 1975 and the passing of the Treaty of Waitangi Act. I was driving back from Taranaki uh, over the weekend. Drove past a number of Māori villages and then kept seeing these marae as I head, headed south through the eight Taranaki tribes through into Ngāti Apa territory, to Whanganui, Ngāti Apa, into Ngāti Raukawa. Every now and then I'd see a marae that it was just the marae. A marae, a wharekai, and an urupa. Village gone. Land gone. And yet that marae still lives. What sort of resilience does that tell you about? What level of resilience would have you all of you having moved away would have you painting that whare, taking your tangi there, holding all of your main events there, still, even when the community is left. And I'm not talking about one or two marae. I would have seen half a dozen of them. That tells you about the resilience of this principle that Kupe brought called whanaungatanga. The demographers, I hope Len will agree with me on this, the demographers, I think, say that Māori are more collectively minded. They contribute more to their community than their Pākehā colleagues, than their New Zealand colleagues. They are more whanaungatanga oriented, even after the trauma of the last hundred years. And we're kind of... We're kind of in a time, well, I've got 50 seconds, we're kind of in a time <laughs> where technology has actually made our whanaungatanga a thing that is achievable in the ether. <coughs> we can find and rebuild our whanaungatanga communities in ways that our, that our parents, actually, in ways that even I struggle to imagine. And whanaungatanga is being reborn on Facebook as my kids tell me, Twitter and, you know, all those other bird things. <laughs> and I think 
Those acronyms are Treaty of Waitangi Act, Tūre Whenua Māori Act, Resource Management Act, Children, Young Persons, Their Family Act currently being reviewed, watch that closely, Criminal Justice Amendment Act 1985, all of which said that tikanga speaks in the law, all of which mean whanaungatanga is important in our environmental management, in sentencing, in the, the treatment of our children, in the administration of our land. So, to me, this is why this hui is so important, whanaungatanga is the great challenge of the post-settlement era. You see, the settlements that our tribes got are actually tiny. Around about $3,000 per head, usually. three dollars to $4,000 per head. About a tenth or less than the sorts of settlements you get in Australia or Canada. A flat screen TV. And the challenge is being able to use that putea in whatever form it is, to reignite the whanaungatanga that whānau and hapu have with their iwi. The danger, I know my time is up, it's yelling at me now, the danger is that iwi will become corporate funds. It's not their fault, the loot is tiny, and it's not enough to touch the lives of their people in a practical way and won't be for a little while. The only way that can be made to work is if partnerships are established with government and iwi to re-enliven and make real Kupe's legacy. You see, the government can't do whānau, hapu and iwi wellness, in my view. It just can't. And with the resources iwi have, they can't either. But as partners, we can give new life in this third phase of our development as a country to Kupe's principle of whanaungatanga. Tēnā koutou katoa.